All right. Welcome everybody to the third merge community call. Um, there's been tons of progress over the past month, month and a half, um, moving towards new test nets, fixing old ones. Uh, and we're going to share a little bit about that and just generally talk about what um, validators, users, and the general community can expect when, when the merge actually happens. Um, let me grab the agenda again. There's a list of things that we've gone over in previous calls, and uh, I think there's a few new things on there. Um, but yeah, does anybody have any topics that weren't added to the agenda that they wanted to bring up uh, that they just want to bring up now? and then I can mark it down and we can get to it later. If not, we can have Tim jump into some stuff. Have we already talked about randomness in previous call? I don't remember. Yes, but I can quickly cover it. The difficulty thing, basically? Yeah, maybe. yeah if we've already talked about it, that's fine. I just wanted to make sure it gets on one of these calls. OK, yes. Um, I do feel like now there's no way we can't cover it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess, unless there's anything, yeah, maybe just to like quickly recap uh, application level changes that matter in the merge, and then we can go into like what happened since uh, since the last piece call. Uh, but like like Mika was saying, there's there's only a couple things that really change uh, in terms of like on chain for applications. Um, one of these things is that uh, the difficulty value gets replaced with uh, the random uh, value from the beacon chain. Uh, so if you are uh, running an application that uses uh, difficulty as a source of ra pseudo randomness, um, this will still work. Uh, it will just be a different uh, random value that we get. And uh, one thing to note is that the random value is much bigger than the current difficult difficulty value. Uh, if if I have the numbers right, I think the current random value or the current difficulty value is about 64 bytes and uh, the difficulty is 256. Um, so that's also a neat way you can check uh, at an app level if the merge has happened. Uh, oh, bits, sorry. So if the yeah, if the the if the value that's returned uh, by this opcode is now 256 bits, uh, it means you're you're in, in a post more post merge world on chain. Um, so that's one of the big changes. Uh, the other changes, anything else that has to do with proof of work. Uh, so things like uh, the uh, anything except the difficulty. So things like the mix hash, uh, the, the list of uncles and whatnot basically all get zeroed out um, at the application la layer. The random value is the only one that kind of gets added, replacing the, the current difficulty value. Um, there are talks where uh, I just saw yesterday there was an EIP published to start uh, specking out withdrawals from the beacon chains. Um, it's quite possible that uh, in the future, the, the the values that had to do with uncle blocks get used for some things like, uh, uh, I think they're state routes in the beacon chain or withdrawal routes. Uh, I'm not sure quite what the term is, but basically that we use this, this uh, that we use we use this, this place in the block header to, to, to just pass information uh, from beacon chain receipts. And then the last kind of big thing that changes um, from an application's perspective uh, is that block times go from 13 seconds on average with a lot of noise uh, under proof of work to uh, 12 seconds exactly uh, under proof of stake. Um, and the, the one thing is uh, if there's, a, if there's a, a proof of stake validator that's offline, they miss their slot. So that means you, know, you, you get the, the chance of a block every, every 12 seconds exactly. It does not guarantee a block shows up. Um, but if it does, it will be kind of on a, a 12 second uh, increment. Um, and right now we've only seen less than 1% of blocks not, not uh, show up on, on the beacon chain just because validators are offline or things like that. So those are the high level changes uh, that you can expect in the merge. There's a bunch of links that Trent has, has, has put in the, in, in the call agenda to, to, dive, to dive more into that. And that's, that's basically it. I think, if we want to quickly like chat about stuff that, that happened since the last of these calls. Uh, so right before Christmas, 
we launched the Kintsugi testnet, uh, which is basically a new testnet that's uh, running the post-merge version of Ethereum. So it has both a, a beacon chain on it and an execution layer, uh, execute some transactions. We did find a couple issues on the network, uh, mostly uh, basically in, in uh, we found a, a couple of initial bugs. Uh, we fixed those, but that led to the network not finalizing for a while. And then we found some more uh, issues that only happened when the network was like in a deep state of, of, of non-finalization. Um, we're in the process of fixing this. Some client teams already have, and we have basically a new spec for a new testnet that's called Kiln. Um, and we expect Kiln to be the last testnet that we launched before forking the existing testnets like Gordy and Robston and whatnot. Um, so I think one thing uh, for applications that's uh, really worth doing, uh, both on Kintsugi that's live today, and if not on Kintsugi, absolutely on Kiln uh, when it goes live, is making sure that like your, your entire tooling workflow and deployment workflow works. Um, it should, and there shouldn't, like, and we've we've tried with like a, a handful of, of applications already and, and things kind of work as expected, but I think uh, you should really see Kill and then if possible, Kintsugi has like a dress rehearsal before the testnet's fork. Um, so if you can deploy a kind of a staging version on that, uh, there is an, an like uh, an infra or it's not infra, but there's like an RPC endpoint you can you can just point to. You don't have to like run your own node if 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 that's not something you usually do for your application. Um, on the Ethereum Foundation blog, there's a, a blog post announcement about Kintsugi that that links up those things, and there'll be another one for Kiln. Uh, but I'll, yeah, I think it's really important to stress this. Like, this is kind of the time to find out that like your, uh, you know, your, your your contract deployment script doesn't work for whatever reason, uh, and or your UI is acting weird for whatever reason. Like, these are the things we're, we're hoping to find out. Um, a special, uh, special eye, I think, is towards like tracing. So the applications we've we've deployed already don't really uh, use like extensive tracing. So if, if you are an application that does um, and you're listening, uh, if you want to try deploying on, on, on Kintsugi and, and Kiln, that would be great. Uh, and if you find issues, uh, if, you can, if you can share that feedback, that'll be super valuable. And, oh, and yeah, the, the, the last thing, uh, I think that I have is uh, trying to have this in the agenda, uh, the idea of uh, outsourcing uh, to a Web3 provider, your execution client is probably not gonna be possible after the merge. Uh, so right now it is possible if you run just a beacon chain node to outsource your uh, kind of ETH1 node to, to say infer or alchemy, because you're only just getting kind of information from the, from the deposit contract. Um, but after the merge, basically, uh, if you're a validator, you need to produce blocks and you get paid to produce blocks, including transaction fees, which are like immediately available to use. Um, and so because of that, you actually need to run your own, uh, your own node on the execution layer. Um, yeah, so that's something that, that people should be, should be aware of. Uh, in the future, there'll be some cryptographic uh, incentives to, 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 or, not incentives, but like disincentives to rely on the third party. I'm not aware today of third parties that are gonna propose um, uh, kind of outsourcing execution clients after the merge. Um, but yeah, I, I think as a validator, basically you are kind of risking a ton of, of revenue by doing that. Um, yeah. Yeah, so just to summarize, if you are currently a validator on the Beacon Chain, and you're not running your own execution client, and that means Geth or Nethermind or anything, one of those clients, uh, you're going to have to start running one uh, before the merge happens. Yes. Uh, and then the other thing you, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say, yeah, we, there, there are a bunch of like ad hoc guides to do that right now, like for Kintsugi, but one thing we are planning for like Kiln is to have a, bit more like detailed guide for like, hey, I'm running a beacon node. How do I add an execution node? Or vice versa, if you are running a node on, on the proof of work Ethereum network today, you're going to need to run a beacon node uh, post-merge to get the head of the chain. So we're going to try and just flesh that out a bit more and like, what do you actually need to do? How do you make sure that you've done it right and so on? 
Yeah, and the other thing you touched on, which is a, a bullet point in the agenda as well, which I'll go over again, is that when you, uh, I guess the bigger point is at the merge, withdrawals aren't enabled. Uh, that's going to be in the upgrade afterwards, which we're probably going to call Shanghai. But um, if you have ETH staked in the deposit contract, you won't be able to access that or exit from the beacon chain at the merge. That happens later. Um, but as Tim mentioned, you will get uh, transaction fees. Those will be immediately available. And actually, um, I think it was the call yesterday. Um, Paul from the Lighthouse team was talking about how, you know, getting that process started about how to design the or standardizing the flow of allowing validators to designate which address receives uh, transaction fees from the execution layer. So something to be aware of, again, ETH isn't unlocked, but transaction fees will be. So you won't be able to withdraw, but you will have some sort of uh, income if you are validating or uh, liquid income, let's say. Uh, there's a question. Marius, do you wanna just answer that in chat or uh, on voice if you're able? Yeah. So. Um... The, the current spec allows for the EL to override what it gets from the consensus layer. So the consensus layer passes uh, the, the Coinbase address uh, to the execution layer, um, but the execution layer, um, like the spec allows for the execution layer to, to, to ignore that and change that. And uh, so what like might happen in the future if, the consensus layer does not provide an address, then it uh, might just take the configured address of the execution layer. Right, and for the recording, that's what was being asked. Do you want to? What do you? What do you think was being asked, Michael? Uh, whether or not it's possible to set up um, multiple execution clients that are backups of each other, so that way, if you need to upgrade like the OS that your execution client's running on, you can fail over to something else. And I don't know if we have the tooling for that built anywhere centralized. Um, is the person who asked that question able to just clarify which of those interpretations is correct? Either in the chat. OK, the second, Micah's interpretation. So, so I don't think we have, uh, someone correct me here, um, Marius may know or Tim or Trent, I don't think there is any tooling that is built by any of the core devs or anything for automatic failover from one execution client to another. So the idea here is you have one beacon client and two execution clients and that way, if you want to turn one of those execution clients off, it'll fail over to another one. So that way you can like operate the hardware or whatever underneath it. And as far as I know, that is not built. Uh, yeah, so uh, we didn't do something like this yet. Um, wouldn't it just possible to be used like a standard um, load balancer that, that supports JSON RPC or some kind of this stuff? Sorry, Did what? Beacon two beacon clients and one execution client is bad or two execution clients, one beacon client is bad. One of those puts you in a very bad situation. I never remember which one it is. Do you remember Marius or? Michael? Well, it, it, like it doesn't really matter as long as you only have one validator signing. Um, yeah, but if you have two beacon nodes that send conflicting set heads, then your execution plan gets confused. Yes, yes. So uh, you, yeah, you can run multiple, like easily run multiple execution clients off of the same consensus. Exactly, client. yeah. The other way around so is just more difficult. And from a configuration standpoint, does the user just need to connect to execution clients and point them both at the same beacon client and that's it? Like everything should just work? Or is there like, will they need to do some sort of special setup for like, for the, the execution client, no. The, like the special setup ha has to be in the in the in the beacon client, in the in the consensus layer client. There you have to specify 
uh, this 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 URL for the uh, for the for the execution client and uh, this uh, another URL for failover. Let me jump in real quick. <laughs> um, if people haven't realized yet, we're moving into sort of open discussion. <clears throat> so if anybody does have a question that isn't addressed in the agenda or isn't coming up naturally, just raise your hand or put it in the chat. Um, otherwise, uh, we could talk all day about random things if you don't bring it up. Keep going, Micah, whoever uh, was talking. Pari, could you uh, expand on that and voice if you're available on how a user might set that up? Sure. Um, usually, most speaker nodes have a concept of a failover RPC. And currently, you can specify that in a flag. So you have your main execution client, and then you have your failover RPC client. For any reason, if the main client is missing, then the beacon node switches to the failover RPC. Um, the same logic would apply in the future. So if you have two execution engines, you should be able to target the main one during regular functioning and the uh, backup one later on. As far as I know, this is an untested feature for the execution client. It's a very stable running feature for just deposits like right now how it is in Beacon Chain. Um, but with the execution engine, I don't think it's a really well-tested feature yet, but it's something that will be tested by the time the merge happens. And while you're running in that mode, if you've got a primary execution client and a failover execution client, will the Beacon client or the consensus client keep the failover execution client up to date? Like, will it be sending it set heads? Mm, that's what I'm not sure of. So I'm not sure of that of that right now, but I think it should send it to both places because currently uh, the beacon node like queries um, both the failover as well as the main one to know how many healthy nodes it's connected to at all times. Um, so I'd assume in the future it would just send a set head message to both. Okay. But you'd have, you'd we'd have to ask a, a CL dev about the exact behavior. Thanks guys. Uh, Remy, your question <clears throat> for the recording, I'll just read it out. How will validators choose the Ethereum account for their transaction fees go into the transaction fees they will gain from proposing a block? I think Paul mentioned that when you start up the node, you will be prompted with, uh, your users will be prompted to enter an address. And I don't think I think what he mentioned was that you won't be able to move past that without entering. And Tim is unmuted and he's going to swoop in with some info. Yeah, so that's basically it. You need to provide it to your node upon startup. But one thing to make clear is you get the transaction fees. Yeah, you only get the transaction fees and not like any, uh, I guess, fee for proposing the block itself. So like the, the fee that you get for actually proposing the block accrues on the beacon chain, but then the actual transaction fees accrue on the execution layer. Um, hopefully that makes sense. But yes, you just enter it about at startup. And in this case, does startup mean <clears throat> like with, what would that look like for somebody who's already running uh, a setup? Like when they install new software, like when they update to the latest release? It'd be a like a CLI flag or environment variable flag or however you configure your client. Um, config file, CLI flag, environment variable. Uh, depends on each individual setup. Uh, there's another question in the chat uh, asking about Downtime in case of network degradation. Um, I don't have a specific like percent loss, but it's, the network is pretty forgiving when you're validating. Um, you're not going to be, uh, you won't be slashed for losing connection. Um, slashing is usually when you're doing something malicious, like proposing an invalid block or something like that. But <clears throat> for simply disconnecting from the network, the the leak is actually pretty small and anybody feel free with more specifics, you can jump in. Yeah, it's like 0.00001 ETH or something like that per uh, block you failed to attest from correctly. 
Um, the time it really ramps up is if lots of people disappear at the same time. So if there's like a major network partition, like across the internet or an actual attack where you have a large section of validators that all try to collude and drop at the same time, um, that's when the leak will start to ramp up much faster. And so for most of the time, you know, if your computer just shuts down, you have a local power or whatever, it's not a big deal. If like your whole country goes offline, your country consists of, you know, 50% of validators, you know, that's going to cause all those people to leak much faster. Um, so it, it really depends on the specific scenario, but for the normal case, what Trent said was exactly right. You're probably not even going to notice. That's one of the reasons why it's important to not correlate yourself by using the same software, same hardware. If you're validating in the cloud, same cloud providers, because if any of those things fail for a large majority of the network, you're going to leak a lot faster than if you're using, you know, less than majority used software and hardware. Minority also, clients. <laughs> Go ahead. Definitely. Um, there's this one more thing that is important. All validators come with a database. It's called the slashing protection database. If for any reason you need to migrate, follow all the procedures for migration. Um, but it, in principle, the slashing prote protection database makes sure that the validator doesn't sign anything that it could get slashed for. So you don't have to worry if you're offline for a bit validator wouldn't automatically get slashed. Uh, yeah, and just a clarification on the terminology. Uh, slashing usually means you're actually being actually penalized. This is different from le leaking. So there's leaking and there's slashing. So leaking is just like, if you go offline, you don't show up to a test, you're not going to get penalized. You're just like leak a little bit of money, if that makes sense. Can I be even more pedantic about the terminology uh, here, please? So. Um, you are penalized for being offline. You receive penalties. They're about the same as the rewards you would otherwise receive. So if you're offline for a day, and then you're back online for a day, you end up even. Um, there is a leak. This is happens when the whole network is not finalizing, uh, and that you receive more severe penalties for being offline. So we call that the, the leak specifically. And then slashing. Slashing is punishment. You're not punished for being offline. You're punished for breaking rules. Um, and that's uh, very severe. You're basically ejected from the network and you lose some of your, your stake. Uh, it's very hard to get slashed. You have to be, um, uh, you have to screw something up in your, in your setup to, uh, to get slashed. You're not going to get slashed in the normal course of events. I'm sorry. So to clarify, uh, um, so initially someone mentioned that uh, if that is a larger number of validators that go offline simultaneously that causes uh, something called a leak and that should uh, aggravate the uh, penalty that uh, offline uh, validators will face uh, how is that Correct. Um, yeah uh the, it it's complicated <laughs> and i've written about it and i'll, I'll drop a url in the <laughs> in the chat but uh, it's never happened on the beacon chain so far so we have never had a leak um on the on the beacon chain uh in the like 13 14 months it's it's been running it should be an extremely rare condition if you are online 80 percent of the time or more during a leak then uh you end up even you you don't earn any reward but you don't uh, get any penalty so uh e even then um but if you're offline more than eighty, uh, more than twenty percent of the time during a leak, then you can be quite heavily um, penalised. But it, it's still not slashing. Slashing is something else. Thank you so much. Uh, just one more clarification on that: um, Does the uh, validator have to uh, always re-authenticate itself with its uh, uh, originating IP address? Or uh, so I'm, I'm imagining uh, some sort of a load balanced infrastructure where. Uh, you've got uh, uh, failover uh, van links where if one goes down, you use the other. Uh, does that really matter? And uh, would it uh, be uh, not too hard for uh, um, uh, this thing to be able to uh, you know, publish itself from a different uh, uh, IP address? Uh, yeah, IP address is more or less irrelevant in the gossip network. Um, so yeah, you can come back. You may if you start, if you lose your database and you lose your um, Ethereum node record, then you um, might have 
it might be slightly slower to find new peers, but we're talking minutes. We're not talking um, hours for that. So basically, yeah, no, no problem at all. I'm going to throw out something wrong here in hopes that someone corrects me. Um, I believe if you want to be very careful with failover validator clients, because if I remember correctly, if you have two validator clients running on two different machines and they're both trying to validate, that is one of the conditions where you can get slashed. Is, is that accurate? Uh, yeah, that's a classic way to get slashed. I think every single instance we've seen so far of slashing has been due to um, people having funky failover mechanisms and um, not minding them carefully. Yeah, basically having two validators running in different places at the same time. Yeah, so in general, the advice that I've heard given out is you're far better off just running one validator and eating the downtime than you are trying to set up a failover node unless you are really, 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 really careful. <laughs> and so like either spend, you know, months of engineering time to set up failover that is very careful to never go wrong or just accept that you'll have some downtime because the downtime is much less punishing than uh, double signing. Yeah, I think this is one of the things, one of the misunderstandings about validating is, um, and I'm not quite sure where this comes from. Maybe it's, we just need to be more explicit in documentation or how, it, how things are communicated. But a lot of people often have the misconception that you know, any sort of downtime is an immediate penalty or it's as severe as slashing or yeah, even using the term slashing, which is like kind of a catch-all term for penalties um, when in reality they mean different things and have very different uh, outcomes. So it's, it's very common, but um, I think for anybody on the call, just understand that uh, having your validator down for a little bit is actually very, very minor in, in the grand scheme of things. Obviously you don't want to, <laughs> you want to get your stuff back online as soon as possible, but um, if you're running a setup, you're not going to lose, lose a major portion. Anything else related to slashing or penalties or inactivity? I have wow. a question for, for Ben. Some, some essays going on in the chat here. Yeah. Is there, if, if you're offline when your validator is due to propose a block, does that affect your, uh, your, your penalty somehow or does it not matter? Uh, only to the extent you don't get the block yes. reward or any transaction fees associated with that. So uh, yeah, indeed, that would be unlucky to be offline when you, you're a block proposer, but there, there's no penalty for being, for not proposing a block. You just okay. miss out on the block reward and the, transaction fees got it thanks that would be like salt on the wound <laughs> if you got extra penalties for missing a missing your slot because you're offline and just generally i should have mentioned this at the beginning but if somebody can respond verbally i know everybody is not, maybe not able to but if you can uh ask or respond to a question verbally it helps because this is being recorded and then it'll be transcribed but the chat is a little more ephemeral. Um, but yeah, I appreciate everybody who's asking questions and answering them in the chat as well. Uh, I'm trying to skim through and catch up. Were there any new questions? Uh, someone asked if the network will be down at the time of the merge. And the answer is no, it will be just like any other oh, yeah. network in the past. Yep. Yeah, and this is kind of related to a, a bigger topic that concerns users, like in reality, users, applications, um, they're not gonna notice any difference leading up to at the point of the merge and directly after. You know, this is like uh, updating some sort of app in the background. Once you open the app, it, it kind of just works. Um, you're not gonna really notice anything. It, the services will continue just the same. <clears throat> um, you won't have to, like more broadly, you're not going to have to transfer your ether to a new chain. Um, you won't have to, or if you're a developer, your contracts aren't going to have to be migrated. You know, what we're trying to do is make the, make this as seamless as possible. And you won't really have to do any sort of transition or migration. Um, everything should be the same. 
One thing to note, though, I guess for um, uh, for like say exchanges or like any application that also deals with like offline uh, or off chain funds and whatnot, um, I think what what you probably the way you probably want to think about the merge is um, we have this terminal total difficulty uh, which triggers it on the proof of work side. So that means once we once we reach that point. Um, no block basically there can only be one set of like children block um that exceed this terminal total difficulty but there can still be multiple ones so like different competing uh forks at that block um then one of those will be chosen uh as basically by the, the the proposer from on the beacon chain for for the next block um and two epochs after that that first kind of post proof of work block will be finalized and that's kind of the stage where you know that uh, everything is is kind of done. Um, and I think Miris had a, had a comment about that with uh, finalizing the RPC. That's probably a good a good segue. But like when you see the first when you see the first block having been finalized uh, on the beacon chain after like the last uh, the last proof of work one, it's kind of when you know that the transition has happened successfully and that this first block is not going to reorg. Um, and say you're in exchange, you can kind of like accept a deposit or like reopen deposits or whatever. Um, yeah, Maris, do you want to take like a minute or two to talk about how this is exposed at the the, uh, the RPC layer? Yes, sure. Um, so we have a lot of calls that <clears throat> that you can either specify a block number or a block hash or you can specify one of three different keywords, uh, latest, pending, or earliest. Um, and what that gives you is, for example, the pending block is the block that hasn't been mined yet. So we, we, we try to apply some of the transactions that we have in the transaction pool on top of the current block to predict which tra transactions might make it into the next block. <clears throat> this is called the pending block, and you could uh, um, you can query your node for that in order to see, for example, uh, if your transaction gets properly executed um, or or not, um, or like the receipt of a transaction if it would be executed. Uh, and we also have the current current uh, block. Uh, which is, uh, you can specify latest, for that you get the current block, the, the best block that the node has seen at the moment, um, that we also have the state for. And um, what we will add in the future, or I already, I think I already added it, but um, the idea is you can also specify, specify final, finalized now, um, in these calls, in these types of calls. And this will give you the last finalized uh, block. So um, basically finalization in, in, in these two works or in post-merge works um, that uh, 164 blocks uh, have been executed on top of a block um, or 64 slots. No, it's two times 64 slots. Um, have been have been passed, then the then the block gets marked as finalized. Um, so it's 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 not the new block, the newest block, but it's uh, some block a bit uh, further uh, a bit of a time ago. But you can always be sure that this block will not change, except for very very like yeah it, no it will it will not change. So um, <clears throat> that's a difference in, in, in how the new world works. Um, you can be sure that uh, stuff doesn't change. Uh, so we make sure to expose this behavior uh, to the user, for example, for, for, um, for exchanges to say, okay, once a transaction has been included in a finalized block or the, the, the block that ha had a certain transaction was finalized, um, then uh, we will accept the payment or whatever. And um, so, yeah, that's basically every call that 
uh, you could specify pending or uh, latest to will now also accept uh, finalized. That's it. If you're subscribed to blocks in some way, um, will there be any indication? Um, or if, if you ask for a block, is there any indication in the response whether that is a finalized block or not? No. Get, get blocked by not, hash, get blocked by number. Okay. Not yet. No. So, uh, and also, like, lots of this is not, not really specified right now. Um, but we implemented it already just to make sure that users can, can use this. And a, a, a minor uh, contentious point in addition slash correction to that. So finalized means that it will not, the no execution client will automatically reorg, no execution client or consent client will automatically reorg past a finalized block. And so the only way to reorg past finalized block would be with some sort of user activated hard fork. And so, so um, this, go ahead. Yeah, you need two thirds of the validators to finalize the competing the competing chain and that implies that a third of the validators on the network would be slashed um so you know the cost is like same order of magnitude as like a large scale 51 percent attack on ethereum so it's it's like possible in the same circumstances that like a deep 51 percent attack on ethereum is yeah and the the key here is that if in order for a reorg, un unlike with the Bitcoin or proof of work, Ethereum today or proof of work networks, they can automatically reorg, you know, back. If someone does launch 51% attack, an automatic reorg can occur and the clients will reorg back however many blocks. It can be up to infinite uh, or up to Genesis, I guess. Um, the caveat here is with proof of stake, we do have the ability to launch a user activated hard fork, which can reorg past the finalization point. And this would be in a very extreme scenario where um, validators have been shown to be actively attacking the network and we want to make sure they get punished for it. And so unlike proof of work, we can, in proof of stake, we actually can punish validators after the fact. So if we see some evidence of malfeasance by validators, by a large chunk of validators that the protocol could not identify, uh, we can go back and slash them later. Now this would be, you know, talked about, this would not be something that just happens automatically. Again, unlike proof of work, None of this would be automatic. This would be a very manual intervention where we tell users, hey, please upgrade your clients that does this rollback. It would be a major thing. So, so don't think that like finalized really is, it does mean finalized in basically all scenarios unless the network is actively under attack by validators in some way, which is unlikely to happen. All right. Unless there are any other comments on this. Uh, there were some other questions. Any final comments? Okay, uh, back up a ways in the chat. Somebody was asking about node requirements. I think Marius responded. Um, can you just summarize what you put into the chat for the, the video or the, the recording? Yes, sure. So if uh, like the requirements don't change too much, um, <clears throat> if you're currently running both uh, the execution layer and the consensus layer node, um, then you should be good. Um, if you're currently only running uh, the consensus layer node and rely on Infura or some other type of service for, for uh, execution layer data, um, then that's not possible anymore. <clears throat> so you need to run your own node, which will increase uh, your uh, hardware requirements. Um, there, there might be like there might be things coming up uh, that uh, will alleviate some of the costs, but in general, it's like if you're currently running both nodes, then you should be good. Um, there are some <clears throat> some times where nodes start to struggle uh, in times of uh, non-finalization. So if the network breaks down then uh, nodes 
will use a lot more disk space than they use during normal uh, operation. Um, but uh, that, first of all, that shouldn't happen on mainnet. And second of all, the teams are already uh, thinking about how to reduce uh, reduce this uh, the, uh, the, uh, the disk space during during times of non finalization. And uh, yeah, that's basically great. Yeah, and then another person asked whether they could run, <clears throat> for example, uh, a validator client or a beacon client on a Raspberry Pi, and then the heavier execution client on something more substantial. And yes, that's possible. Um, Tim, do you want to summarize the question about block rewards again, just, just so we're, we have it in a couple different places phrased differently? Maybe my explanation earlier wasn't good enough. Go so, where the block, so the block, the block rewards, basically, there is no block reward on the execution layer post merge, right? Like the rewards that exist on the beacon change on the beacon chain go unchanged. So you get today already rewards for proposing a block on the beacon chain. You get rewards for attesting to others blocks on the beacon chain. So that stays the same. And then transaction fees on the execution layer stay the same. So you know every transaction on Ethereum pays a fee. Part of that fee is burnt. The rest of the fee goes to the block producer. Um, and so after the merge, validators who are block producers get the sub of those two things. They get their current rewards on the beacon chain um, to the same extent that they've already had. There's no like increase or anything like that. Um, it's still based on the total number of validators, that whole thing. Um, but they also get the transaction fees uh, from the execution layer sent to any Ethereum address that they want. Uh, so this means that they don't, they're not subject to being locked. A validator does not need to, to, to withdraw or to have a partial withdrawal to, to have access to those funds. They're immediately available. Is this? Okay, awesome. Perfect. Yeah. Take your um, thumbs up. Let's see, what else do we got here? Oh, the one thing we haven't touched on yet is what happens to test networks or test nets uh, after the merge. And I think Tim probably has the clearest picture of this. Do you want to summarize for, for any developers on the call? Yeah, I don't think we're 100% set on it yet, but what seems, what's going to happen for sure is some test nets will be deprecated. What seems likeliest, um, and again, this could change, is that uh, Rinkeby does not transition to the merge. So Rinkeby seems like the least likely test nets to, to make it. If your application runs on Rinkeby only, I would strongly suggest starting to look at other test nets basically now. Um, Robston seems likely to transition through the merge, uh, but then be shut down sometime after. Um, I'm not sure how, how quickly, but I think if you're on Robston, you also probably want to look at, at alternatives. Gordy seems very likely to just transition and stick around uh, long term. So uh, if you're if you're on Gordy, you're you're probably good. And then finally, uh, there's a new proof of work testnet that was launched uh, a couple months ago called Sepolia, and the the goal is likely to transition Sepolia over, uh, run the merge on it, and then maintain it instead of Robston, uh, just because it's a bit of a newer testnet and it's it's less heavy. Um, so TLDR, Gordy and Sepolia are looking like the best candidates post-merge. One thing also is um, there's testnets basically have two values. One of the values is like a staging environment for applications. The other value is like a staging environment for client devs. And the things you want to test uh, for client devs are, are slightly different. Like we'd like to test our client software uh, in cases where the network is not, uh, not finalizing, for example, and, and things are aren't going well. Um, and that's obviously not great for, for applications who probably just want to test on like a, a copy of mainnet. Um, so there's plans to like make one of the, the like post-merge test nets more geared towards like client testing where 
we, we regularly turn off some validators, uh, cause it not to finalize, make sure that, uh, that the client software can handle that. Um, and then there's another one that'll probably be a bit more stable um, and, and where you, know, you can expect kind of similar situations to mainnet. We haven't really made that call yet. Uh, but it's it's probably going to be you know Gordian Sepolia are likely to be like one of each. Um, yeah, so that's that's something we'll, we'll we'll have better information on in the next couple of weeks. Uh, but if you are on Rinkeby, uh, definitely suggest looking uh, looking at deploying on other test nets. Uh, the other one, sorry, like Coven is the one where I really don't have a view. It's a bit unclear what the situation is there. Um, I know in the past uh, they've lagged updating it until after May after mainnet has updated. Uh, I think there were some plans to update it for the merge, but it's it's not fully clear to me yet. So I think, um, yeah, if 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 you are just on Coven, you probably want to reach out to like the maintainers of it to to understand a bit better what the what the plan is there. Yeah, somebody asked me about that the other day, and I I had no idea what's going on with Coven. Cool, excellent summary. Uh, any questions about test nets and which ones are gonna stick around, which ones are probably gonna be deprecated? If not, I think those are all the things I noted from the discussion. Um, somebody asked about incentivizing solo staking. I think we touched on that earlier about um, there are anti-correlation penalties. And if you abstract that or de-abstract that, uh, that would mean if you're staking on the same cloud provider, you know, if, if the majority of the network is all on AWS and AWS went down, that there would be a pretty big slashing event. Or no, there would be a inactivity leak. And that's one way solo staking is incentivized. Um, there are other, maybe not incentives, but initiatives from people like Superfizz and the eStaker community to onboard more people. And I know Remy has also done some work um, with guides and in helping people understand the best practices for running your own validator guide. So there's a ton of community work that's gone into solo staking and that's probably gonna continue. Uh, I don't see it stopping anytime soon because that's definitely, if you're able to, uh, a really great way to learn about the network and participate on your own terms with your own hardware. Um, if anybody else has other comments on solo staking, feel free to jump in. Uh, please run a minority client. <laughs> yeah, yeah, everyone. of course. Uh, what is a minority if you client? I haven't decided. Micah, uh, not tell us Geth, what Not Geth and not Prism. So for your execution right. client, do something that's not Geth. And for your consensus client, do something that's not Prism. Um, you pretty much can't go wrong uh, as long as you don't choose those two. <laughs> And this is, yeah, just to be clear for anybody, anybody who's a validator currently or is looking to get into it soon, um, Prism and Geth are great clients. You know, they've been around for years. They have great people working on them. This is nothing against those teams, but client diversity is really, really important. Um, and it's not something where we want to, like, it, it's only an issue once once it's a problem, you know, it's not something where it's causing a problem now, but it'll be an issue um, once there's uh, a failure to finalize or a bug in one of the majority of clients. So we want to take care of the, the problem now rather than down the road when there's actually a, a bigger problem. Anything else in the chat? Uh, yeah, somebody asked about timing, and Marius rightfully answered, it'll happen when it happens, basically. <laughs> um, yeah, there's a checklist. I don't have the link on me now, but maybe if somebody has the, uh, Tim's, Tim's going to get it. But yeah, it, it's hard to predict when everything happens, and I know everyone is in crypto is used to um, things taking longer than they seem that they should take. Uh, it's kind of the way it goes. Uh, but one thing we want to be really clear on is that any upgrades are secure. You know, like there's no bugs and it's not going to introduce issues if it, if it goes live. We're not testing in production. Um, 
So security and safety for the chain, stability, these things are all way more important than hitting a certain deadline. So the, the broader answer is, you know, the merge will happen when it happens, when all the client teams are comfortable, when there's been enough testing, um, we've gone through the transition enough times and everybody is confident that um, this is going to this is going to go through well, and it's not going to cause other issues. Oh, right. There's the link. Um, yeah, the things in this readiness checklist aren't, you know, it's not like they all have equal weight. So uh, take that with a grain of salt, but it's a pretty, it's a good way to get an overview of the things that are being worked on, a bunch of great links to the work and um, what's left. So if you're interested in timing, this is probably your best bet for understanding when the merge is actually going to take place. Go ahead, Tim. Oh, yeah. So one thing uh, I'll post this in the agenda as well. But uh, Frederick at the EF has helped set up a Google group uh, that people can subscribe to to get like blog posts, uh, announcements uh, about the merge. Uh, so. We will post everything on blog.ethereum.org, and I think there's already uh, uh, RSS feed. So if 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 you're on RSS, you can use that. Um, but if you just want to get like a simple kind of digest of the the, up, the upgrade news uh, related to the merge, um, let me share the link in the chat here. We'll make sure there won't be more than the blog post, but you'll get an email saying, "Hey, there's a new blog post." Um, yeah, so you can just join here if you're not using uh, Google or Gmail, you can just, if you send an email to this email that I posted at announcements plus subscribe at ethereum.org, uh, it'll reply back uh, and, and ask you to subscribe. Um, it did go in my spam the first time, so please check that. Uh, but generally it should work uh, for any any email provider uh, if you just wanna, uh, yeah. Uh, if, if you just wanna heads up when these upgrades are published. Uh, someone again asked about whether Infura can be used um, after the merge. No, you should start getting used to running your own execution client uh, leading can, up to the merge. Can I just clarify that, trend? If you're staking, then the encouragement is to run your own execution client. Infura is undecided about whether they'll provide that, but that's by the by. If you're staking, run your own client. If you are running a DAP and you're providing a service and you just hook into the normal ETH1 mm. APIs, you don't. You can just carry on using Infura or Alchemy or whoever you use, as you always have done. You don't need to uh, get involved with this side at all. If you want to run your own node, if you're currently running your own ETH1 infrastructure for your DAP, you will also need to run an ETH2 client, a, a consensus client alongside that. So you've basically got kind of three scenarios there, and we should distinguish them um, carefully. Yep, yeah, no, that's my mistake. I thought he was asking about validating. Yeah, just for applications or APIs, you can still use Infura or any Web3 provider. I'm, I'm assuming we've got confirmation from Infura that they are planning on starting to run validator client or because uh, those clients on their back end, like they are going to. Yep. Yeah, yeah, already do. Okay. Yep. okay. okay. Um, we're down to the last few minutes. It's been a lot of great discussion. Uh, and I appreciate everybody who joined and asked questions, or if you're a developer, you took time to come and answer the questions. Um, is there anything we missed or should quickly summarize? This is your chance to speak up. Great, we've covered everything. Um, so the thing that we've been talking about in the chat, the with regard to unsafe head and safe head. So when by the time the merge goes live, the expectation is is that when you ask for the latest block, um, you will get what's called the safe head, and the safe head is about 12, 12 seconds behind real time ish, 12, 16 seconds, something like that. Um, so just be aware, you can ask for unsafe head, but unsafe head is very like is likely to get reorged, so be prepared. So if you ask for unsafe head, um, I don't think JSON RPCs are available yet, but eventually 
before the merge it should be. You ask for unsafe head, that'll give you the absolute latest and greatest. So if you're like hey, someone doing MEV or something where you absolutely need to know the, exactly the latest things going on, um, you can get that. Just be aware that is likely to get reorged, um, like high probability. If you ask for the safe head or latest, what you're used to getting, you're now going to get blocks a little later than you do currently. So they're going to be delayed by 12, 16 seconds or so. And, um, but the, on the plus side, it is very unlikely that those will get reorged. Like they'll only get reorged in very bizarre scenarios. In almost all cases, it's probably going to stick around to finalization. Um, so just be aware that uh, things are going to get a little slower if you continue, if you just do nothing and just continue to use latest. And if you want to be on the bleeding edge like you are today in terms of timing, then you'll have to switch over to unsafe head and be aware that the reorg chances are kind of high with that. Great. Yeah, uh, somebody asked where this will be recorded or where the recording will be hosted and it will be on the Ethereum Cat Herders YouTube where the other calls have been uploaded. And I think we've been producing notes for all of them. So uh, if you'd rather read this than listen to it, it'll be available on one of the, the repos that we'll link to. Um, as a final final note, if anybody on the call was looking in, looking to get into validating on their own or just curious about proof of stake generally, you want to learn more about participating in consensus, I cannot uh, recommend Superfizz and the ETH Staker community more than, I can't recommend them enough. Um, you should definitely check them out. They've done great work, like I mentioned earlier. Um, you know creating tutorials, helping people understand what's required of them. And uh, yeah, definitely get involved with that community. They're amazing. Yeah, thanks. I, if, does my audio even work? I, yep. I've spent the past hour fighting with, uh, with my audio. So uh, yeah, it's, it's great to be here. I can't wait to go and catch up. Um, but yeah, so Eastaker tries to be a welcoming first and knowledgeable second community. And that's a really weird thing for a lot of technical people, but we really just want to welcome people and help them feel comfortable getting into staking. Um, we don't have all the answers, but we will welcome you and help you figure things out as you go. So yeah, we'll be glad to have anyone. Yep. And as, as Marius mentioned, we are more than happy to have anybody help us test the merge. And that just means, you know, joining the test net, breaking things where they can be broken, and then telling Marius how you broke it. So if you're interested in helping with that, join the Ethereum R&D Discord. Um, if you need a link to that, just DM me on Twitter, and I will, I'll send you a, an invite link. I don't have it on hand right now. But yeah, uh, thank you again, everybody, for coming. Also, uh, if you're a dApp developer, deploy your dApp on testnet to see if the dApp works. Like uh, the the smart contract should like there shouldn't be a problem there. But also uh, check out if uh, like your backend works. If uh, like we we make some changes to how the the header uh, works and stuff like this. So. It would like I would advise any project to deploy their code um, and also test it with with their backend on the new test nets. Yes, test the merge, deploy your applications, and we're gonna make it. We're all gonna make it. All right, I think we can wrap there. One minute over. Thank you again, everybody. We'll see Thank you Jen. somewhere online. Thank you. Thanks, guys.